Hello and welcome to the Switch for Good podcast. I'm Alexandra Paul and I'm here with my co-host Dotsie Bausch. Hi Dotsie. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Maybe you're listening to this. Yeah. We're so excited to be here today and have you guys join us. Dotsie, you were in D.C. Uh, talking with the USDA recently. And can you tell us about that? Because the USDA has a lot to do with the food on our plate. You betcha. Yeah, I just got back <clears throat> from Washington not too long ago. So uh, the USDA, United States Department of Agriculture, reviews the dietary guidelines for Americans every five years. Uh, one might hope that it was the U.S. Department of Health, but it's not. <laughs> it's the agribusiness that decides who, uh, well, yes, who and what is on our plate. So this was a public commentary uh, period of time uh, for people to come in and um, give opinion and commentary on uh, the changes that we think should be made. So there were 72 speakers. We each had three minutes to speak. And I specifically focused on um, dairy. Shocking, I know. Uh, <laughs> and my ask at the end was that they recommend uh, for the new dietary guidelines that come out next year that dairy be removed as a food group. And I mostly, uh, in my whole three minutes, I did a little bit of, of health and performance, but I mostly focused on food justice. Oh, that's perfect, because our guests today, we're going to talk about food justice can't issues. Wait to dive into yeah. that. And I, it was really, a couple of us did that. Dr. Milton Mills did it as well, and a couple of other, uh, a couple of other folks whose recommendation was that, f that dairy be removed as a food group for humans from the dietary guidelines, and uh, just in the wake of our neighbors from the north, Canada just removed dairy as a food group for humans. Um, so it, it's really, we'll go deeper into it in, in this episode, which I'm stoked to do. Um, especially with our guests, but I, I don't think that the panel, um, the USDA panel, which was about 10 white people, uh, mostly men, had probably ever considered or thought about the food justice issues with dairy. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to stop there because we really are going to get deep into this in, in this episode. But there were a lot of um, <clears throat> clearing of the throats and wide eyes and sort mm -hmm. of shaking of the heads. You could tell that this was... Um, just so sadly, something they had never considered or recognized was a true problem. Well, between you and Dr. Mills, who was our first guest on this podcast, mm -hmm. you surely were very, very powerful advocates for taking dairy off uh, our plates and off the USDA recommendations. What about the other 72 or 70, uh, mm -hmm. 69 uh, mm -hmm. people there? What were, the, what were they to kind of tr pushing for? Well, I would say about half were advocating for a whole food plant-based diet. So that really? was refreshing and exciting to hear for all sorts of different reasons. Um, Dr. Garth Davis was there, Dr. Michael Greger, um, like I mentioned, Dr. Mills, um, Susan Levin from PCRM, their, their head dietitian. <clears throat> and the other half were advocating for either a low carb diet, which was frustrating to, to hear for a couple of reasons. Uh, and obviously, low carb. What did they want to do? Take away the, Atkins? Take away the potatoes and the squashes and things like that. Well, so that's where it's just super frustrating. So the keto people, you know, the, the dietitians or nutritionists that spoke on behalf of that. First of all, they weren't even making any reference or consideration for what their patients might look like uh, internally in five years, ten years, fifteen years, twenty years. You know, they're just saying, oh, for you know, they've lost weight. Well, right, it's calorie restriction for you know the last six months or year, two years. So that was troubling that they're not looking forward to their patients health and longevity for the future. And the other thing that was ridiculous is they were not separating the difference between a donut and a potato. <laughs> Just mm, low, carb, really low, carb, low carb, low carb, low carb. Processed carbs that should be the dirty word, but not carbs. Carb no. Carbohydrates, which is the real word, um, are not bad for you. It's our fuel so source for energy. <laughs> it feeds our brain. I mean, you know, you need glycogen. Your brain runs off of glycogen. I mean, yeah. we'd all r run around or lazily walk around um, without anything going on upstairs if we did not receive carbohydrates, glycogen from carbohydrates. It's, 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 it's critical. <sighs> so... You know, I love you, to talk about potatoes all the time and how it's I eat like them. It's like your favorite. I know. She literally eats potatoes <laughs> in between episodes with garlic that's sauce. Right, that's like right, whole I do. potatoes dipped so, in it. And I haven't gained weight from it. So, no, or, it's so necessary. <laughs> it was... You also had a lot of industry, right? So you had um, the Dairy Council, mm -hmm. and you had the Cattlemen's Beef Association, and you had the potato people. Oh, that yay. Were, And she was kind of like, give us a break. <laughs> Potatoes are good. You know what I mean? It's really like... It's like 
<laughs> we were just like, yay. Uh, and you had the, the, you know, the nut people there. Oh, awesome. And um, you had the egg people. That mm, guy, the awesome. egg guy talked about choline for three straight minutes oh, as if there's no other mm. way to get that nutrient. So, yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much for being there and representing. Appreciate it. And, and so we'll talk more with our guest about uh, this food justice issue. Uh, John Lewis, who is a friend of both of ours, he's also known as the Badass Vegan, is the founder and the CEO of the nutrition company, also called Badass Vegan. And he has a bachelor's degree in marketing and a master's in business, which is probably why his vegan smart nutrition line is in so many stores around the country. You know, he's putting together his marketing genius with his business savvy and... He also, my favorite flavor is his signature um, blend called BAV, stands for Badass Vegan, right. and it's called Strawberry Shortcake, and it's really, really good. I haven't gotten to taste it. Yeah. Where well. did you do this <laughs> without me? John and I, we have a special <laughs> relationship. So <laughs> oh, actually, right. let me tell you how I met John. I was at Real Food Daily, and I see this handsome man at this other table, and I think I, I recognize him, and I know it's Veg Fest week or something, so I know... Anyway, so he comes over, my, maybe I, or I go over to him, and we start talking, and sure enough, he's speaking at VegFest, I'm speaking at VegFest, and so then he sends me a bunch of product. Can you, he, <gasps> follow, he actually follows through. Most people go, yeah, I'll send you send stuff. Send you something. And, and it was, it was so fun Aww. just tasting all the different flavors that he has. I bet it yeah, was. Yeah, yeah, so fun. So, yeah, my friend Zoe from England was it was home, was at a, visiting me at the time, so we all... <laughs> We took pictures. We posted it. Yeah. So That's awesome. anyway, he's also a fitness trainer and a speaker. He speaks all around the country. You've been on several panels with him, too. And he is currently working on, among other many projects, um, he also has some great T-shirts and clothes on his on mm -hmm. his um, on his website. Uh, but he's working on a documentary that I really want to talk to uh, talk about called Hungry for Change. And. I think he's in Miami right now, but he came, he was in Canada yesterday. So I think he's in Miami where he lives right now. So welcome, John Hi. Lewis, also known as the Badass Vegan. Hi. Uh-oh, I can't hear him. Can you hear him? No. There we go. Oh, oh there, there we, we go. Oh, there we go. You were still on mute. <laughs> hey, he, he actually put himself on mute during our introduction because he was worried yeah. that he, he might <laughs> laugh up for during our incredibly... Because <laughs> we're so funny. <laughs> That's right. Hi, John. Welcome to Switch for Good. Thank you for having me. Definitely. <clears throat> so we talked a lot about what you're doing presently in your business life and doing so much good, talking all around the country and, and in other countries, too, about the benefits of being uh, plant-based. But you were actually mm -hmm. born to a drug-addicted mother who once tried to sell you for drugs, mm -hmm. and so you were raised by your grandmother in Ferguson, Missouri. Correct. That is correct. Yes. Um, yes. So she took over uh, my grandmother, who I, I've never ever called her grandmother to her face. I just use her as grandmother as a reference and a story when I'm always telling the story. Uh, she only found out only two weeks prior to the birth that the adoption was about to happen and that I was going to be sold for more drug money. And that's when she stepped in. And she took over and she legally adopted me uh, so that at birth I ended up with her, which is kind of interesting that I ended up at the household with the mother being raised as my sister and the grandmother raising me as my mom. Oh. So it was, it was a lot. It was a big dynamic. <laughs> that, so I didn't know that. did you not know that your mother was your mother? You thought your mother was your your biological mother was your sister? Yeah, so I was supposed to find out at age 16. That was the whole deal, wait till I was 16. But the birth mother told me at four. So I think that's why I'm good at acting now because I acted like I never, around anybody else, I acted like I never knew. So I never told my grandmother uh, the case that I knew beforehand. Um, I just stayed with it. Wow, that's, that's pretty heavy. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask, what is your earliest childhood memory of your mom who you thought was your sister uh and and what experience did you have with her it actually was pretty decent it was it was like a sister brother relationship really okay. it wasn't uh it wasn't bad it actually was uh i think she had less stress off of her to worry about you know a child and then you know having to worry about addiction and then she was still in high school so mm -hmm. it was a lot that she would have had to deal with herself so for me, 
it, it was actually good. I mean, it was like having a big sister. She, you know, she would take me around to places, things like that. I mean, I knew I knew there were some things that she was doing that probably wasn't the best, but, I, you know, she treated me like a little brother, mm-hmm. like, the whole time. So we actually had a good relationship. Did she recover quickly then? Because if she was going to sell you for drugs, she was obviously still a drug addict when you were little. Not necessarily, no. She, you know, later on in life, I know that she was still, you know, addicted to some things. Uh, and it, it wasn't necessarily, I would say, crack at that point, but it was definitely some other things. Mm-hmm. Um, I, in fact, I remember... As time went on, she was celebrating like a two year, you know, a hiatus from cocaine. So, you know, that was and that was I was an adult by then. So that was still later on in life. Definitely. How did by the way, Jack Nicholson also grew up the same way you did uh, living with his sister, who was actually his biological mother, thinking. But he thought that his grandmother was his mother. Um yeah. And so it's not, I mean, it's not common, but it does happen. And right. boy, you... To you, all the great people. Yeah, wow. I know, really, to all the really successful, <laughs> hardworking folks. So, I, think, I think it honestly, I think it honestly helps you. It builds character. It builds, mm-hmm. like, I, I think I could have went either way. I could have went to, like, a, a pissed off, regretful, upset side, or I could have went through, like, a... Well, you know what? That happened. I'm not going to let that happen again. I'm going to break the cycle. Mm-hmm. So it was more like me. I was like, I'm just going to break the cycle and I'm just going to I'm just going to move past it. Wow. Kudos to you for making them the best and letting it make you stronger instead of uh, falling into habits that, you know, your mom had and things. Um, when you were a teenager, right. you were very overweight. You were 315 pounds. And looking at you now, yeah. you're the f- incredibly <laughs> fit and lean and defined and healthy. What was going on then when you were 13? And how did you overcome that? Um, I think it, I don't even think it was emotional eating. I think it was more that I, being born, I uh, guess you could say as a crack baby, the term, um, I, I have found out, especially as an adult, I have a very addictive pattern. Mm. Um, and I was, I was addicted to sugar, sweet, still am. Like, I think, you know, that's one of the things addiction, uh, people that are addicted to things have to come to grips with is that once you're an addict, you are always an addict. You may be able to adjust it and to, uh, not listen to the addiction, but it's always there. And for me, it was always sugar, sweets, foods, you know, all the best stuff, you know, the, the sad diet, the standard American diet. And I just was so addicted to it. And I think, you know, my mother being my grandmother, she was very uh, compensating with making sure that I never had to want for anything really. So it was so much in the house. It was an overabundance. Like we honestly, it was just her and I in the house at that point because everybody had moved out and she took me in at the age of 40. So the kids were pretty much grown and gone. And there was honestly easily 13 boxes of cereal in the house at once. Mm-hmm. Just that's just one example. So it was like always an overabundance. And, she, and it wasn't because she did a bad job. She was doing the best she could. And she was trying to, you know, make me happy. Mm-hmm. But she I just over, overindulged. And, and also being a child athlete, you know, you got to remember when you when you play childhood sports, there's no real cardio involved. <laughs> it's like the coach just throws the balls out in the court. So, hey, go do layup drills. And I think once I got to high school, and I got involved with, you know, actual a program where I'm doing two a days in football. I'm doing, you know, the I'm running at least six, seven miles for basketball. Everything started to change. And that's when like the weight just kind of disappeared. And I had a major growth spurt as well. So that helped out, too. And so did you become more conscious of what you ate during your high school years or did you were you just able to burn no. it off? No, 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 not at all. Uh, it was just, it was just activity level, just quadrupled. You could say, it just really like turned on. Like I just really, and and then I, I saw that. I think that's when you know, as a kid, everybody thinks, oh, I want to do this, I want to play in the NBA. But I actually saw it as, oh wait, I can get out of the hood by doing this. I can do something with this if I use this the right way. And I think that's when it really took over because I just. I just became, I always say that's my first love. That was, that just, I didn't think about anything else. And to this day, when I go in the gym, everything is gone. Like, it doesn't matter what's going on. When I'm playing ball, whatever it is, everything just disappears. And that just started to be my saving grace. 
And then I played semi-pro basketball for a little while. Um, and then I ended up going back to graduate school to pursue my master's in business. So what happened? You pursued your master's in business. Did you go, were you already vegan then? When did you become vegan and what inspired you to go vegan? Yeah, so I, I was in grad school. And one thing coming from St. Louis, Ferguson area, um, there's not a lot of diversity when it comes to people or food. So everything was fast food, McDonald's, you know, whatever, Kentucky Fried Chicken. And when I moved to Miami, it was such this melting pot that I was eating every culture under the sun, Haitian, Jamaican, you know, Dominican, Cuban. And I'm just trying all these foods and my stomach was just not happy with me. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, I remember going to the school doctor at my grad school and and, uh, he asked me, he was like, do you eat a lot of meat? And I was like, no, you know, we're humans. We lie. It's just automatic to lie. But, you know, if you really think about it, we eat meat on everything, cheese on everything. You probably didn't realize it, though. You probably didn't realize that you ate meat pretty much every Mm -hmm. meal. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, I say it all the time. We we confuse normal with right. So it's normal that everybody else is doing it. So I didn't think I was doing a lot. And so he told me, he was like, well, how about you try not eating meat for 30 days? And I looked at him. I was like... Are you crazy? I'm like, look, you know, the classic saying, like, look at me, look at my size. Are you crazy? I got to maintain this. And uh, I had a good friend who passed away from sickle cell um, in October 2004. And I was like, OK, as a as an old to him, I'm going to try this vegetarian thing out. And it was crazy. With I didn't even make it to 30 days. Within like 15 days, I felt like a million bucks. And I was like, whoa, this is crazy. Did you take out and- dairy, too, or just meat? Just me. Oh. At first, I was vegetarian. I just wanted to try it out. And then uh, fast forward about another year and a half, I was finishing up grad school, and I got a call from my brother. And, and I, it was interesting. I was literally in the last week of my graduate program, and I was doing what we call a capstone. So I'm in this class with all the graduates, and, and my phone is, like, buzzing. And I'm, like, trying to ignore it. I keep pressing it to ignore. And I noticed my brother, but he kept calling. So I was like, okay. And I was like, I'm sorry, sir, I got to take this. And I go out and he's like, hey, and my brother is really my uncle. So he, yeah. another dynamic to it. My right. brothers are really my uncles. Right. <laughs> so right. very, very, it's, it's a lot, to, it's a lot <laughs> twisted turns in the life here. Uh, so, but he, he only calls me son if I either messed up right. or something's messed up. Hmm. And he's like, hey, son. He goes, I'm, I'm here with your mom at the hospital. We don't know what's wrong. And I'm like, oh, man, what's going on? And so he's like, we don't know. We're about to run some tests. She just can't keep any food down. And when you say mom, do you mean your grandmother or your biological mother? Grandmother, yeah, yeah, yeah. Grandmother. Yeah, okay. grandmother. And the test came back, colon cancer. Mm. So I remember talking to the doctors, like, how did this happen? What's going on? And he's like, the doctor's like, too much animal protein, this and that. And I'm like, really? I'm like, wow. so this is not hereditary? And he's like, no, this is a lifestyle choice. And... While I didn't switch immediately, I started doing my own research and I started looking and started seeing and like, wait a minute, this is not a hereditary thing. This is like what we're putting in our bodies. And yeah, so it's been 13 years now since I since I made the switch. Um, and that's what led to it. Because I always say that it's great to learn from your mistakes, but it's great to learn from other people's mistakes, too. You know, like I mm-hmm. if my mother I saw what my mother went through, having her colon removed having a bag put in mm. and then saying she could have left with, she could have lived with the bag for the rest of her life but she was like no I'm not going to do that so she had the second surgery which a lot of people never do and had the colon put back in so you know just seeing all that pain and just the anguish to go with that I was like no nah, I I'm going to learn from that and I'm, I made the switch up like a donor colon I'm assuming I think um, what they do is they shorten it. They shorten the they intestine. They shorten yeah. their own. Yeah. Not, okay. So Took they out don't, the cancerous part. Take, yeah. yeah, they take out the cancerous mm-hmm. and then they mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. join it up. Yeah, mm-hmm. but it just means that the body absorbs less nutrients as it's going through mm-hmm. its digestive exactly. process. What an amazing doc. I mean, that's pretty much the opposite story uh, that we hear over right. and over and over again, right? That, that, that they're, they're yep. not... At, so this doctor, do you know... Uh, he or she, how they gathered their information and education that was not in medical school, that what their story was or how they knew. Not this. even, not even a clue. Yeah. That, Cause I, in my head, I wasn't even, I was still, you know, 20, you know, early twenties. I yeah. was like, I was still confused with everything that was going on. So I didn't even bother to like 
ask, like, hey, where'd you get your research from? You know, like, it just was like, whoa, wait a minute, what? Like, this is crazy. Dude. But I, I did, he did, he was a catalyst hmm. in, in helping me make the switch for good. <laughs> the, the, the <laughs> there you go. Um, there you did go. your did your mother was she able to switch her diet after she had this? Not did she all. believe them? Not yeah. at all. It is it, it's so so interesting. I tell everybody that like my my family thinks I'm crazy, but I'm the only one not on medication or have gone through <laughs> half the things that they went through. So it's like they're always like, Oh, good for you. Oh, you know, I wish I could do that. I'm like, Yeah, you can, but then they're just like they're taking all these medications, you know, they go through all these different ailments, but I have um, my brother, um, which one of my uncles, but actually my brother, he has made the switch. Uh, he's part of the documentary as well, too, um, to get off a lot of the medications and, and help with his weight issues and all the other issues that he has going on as well. Yeah, that's great. Before we dive into the film and, and the, mm-hmm. the food justice, uh, I love the story that you tell, that I've heard you tell before, um, how you got uh, the name Badass Vegan. So you got to share that. Uh, it's, it, it's a couple couple things that led down that avenue. Uh, one would be uh, I was a bad kid, so my mom always called me badass. So, <laughs> so that helped. But one I day, hadn't heard uh, that part like, of it. I like it. Yeah, yeah. So that that helped out. But there was always um, I always ask people if they ever seen the P90X uh, films or workout videos. I was actually one of the. Uh, uh, characters, I guess you could say, on the infomercials, they use my my testimony because I actually went through the program. I did everything and uh, I would always post my videos and they use me on the commercials and the ads. So one day one guy commented on my, uh, on one of my YouTube videos and he's like, man, you are one badass vegan. And I was like, I kind of like that. I was like, I was like, I was like, thank you. I probably owe him like 1% of everything I'm doing. Now. Like, I definitely, definitely that stuck in a it, it rang a bell and I remember taking a jog and because at that time I was doing a lot of half marathons and I remember do, like doing like probably like a nine mile run a day and I was like you know what I need to start a company and the first thing I did I went to GoDaddy I looked up the word you know I looked at badassvegan.com it was available and I just bought it and that was like 2000 I want to say 2010 I want to say and from there it just it just went on and and the whole premise behind Badass Vegan I don't, I don't know if I ever told you this part it was supposed. It wasn't supposed to be me. Badass vegan was never supposed to be me. It was supposed to be like a Facebook for vegans mm. to come and hang out and be able to just have a safe place where they don't have to worry about you know meat on this page or advertising from this. It really was supposed to be this like safe haven and a social media uh, avenue for a lot of people. Uh. It just took its own wings though and just turned into being me. That's why I always say. That's so why I would say, like, everybody's a badass vegan. If you're a vegan, you're a badass vegan. It's not really me. <laughs> I just happen to be the face of it somehow. But that, that, that's There are the no lame like, vegans. Group. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Everybody's a BAV. <laughs> yeah. So you started your nutritional company, which has this line of shakes uh, called that's under the, the brand Vegan Smart. Vegan Smart. Yeah, Vegan Smart is uh, my, my protein shake brand. Uh, I teamed up with two of my uh, fraternity brothers and we partnered up and did that. And we just, it's, it's been crazy. Um, the love that we've gotten from it. Like the thing is too, we, we put a lot of work into it. Uh, and, and I, I'm one of the few protein shake owners that actually tell people to try out all the companies. I'm like, no, try out everybody. You might not like mine. You might like Vega. You might like clean machine. You might like, you know, there's so many out there, uh, you know. He, he's promoting uh, them right now, actually. See, that's yeah. how generous he is and See confident. what works for you. That's yeah, the truth, exactly. though. That's good. Yeah. Like, my thing is, if you're going vegan, I don't care. Like, just, <laughs> yeah. that's it. That's how, that's the that's the end goal is oh. to get everybody vegan. Now, will I see it in my lifetime? I'm very understandable, and I do realize that probably is not going to happen. But we could also be the catalyst to get it going to get to that point. I have a question um, as we dive into it and food justice. I, I, I uh, want to get in here. Your journey of dropping dairy and do you have an intolerance? Can you digest it? Like what's, were you having issues? Did they change? What, what happened? What's your dairy journey, your dropping dairy journey? The, my dairy journey definitely was not a good one. Uh, it definitely had to do with like when I went to that doctor when I was in grad school and him telling me to, you know, try this whole vegetarian thing because 
even though I felt good when I got rid of it, when I went completely vegan, I just felt my body just, it was amazing how the change happened because I, I, I had a good friend who was vegan. Um, she was a sister of a good friend of mine and we became good friends through him and she was already vegan uh, when I moved to Miami and she kept telling me, she was like, when you go vegan, you're going to feel this difference. You're just going to feel this difference. I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure. Sure, sure, sure. And I never forget, I was playing basketball one day and I went to go dunk a ball and it was in the middle of a game. And I literally felt the energy from like my ankle all the way to when I dunked the ball, like it traveled through me. Mm -hmm. And I just remember this feeling. And I, I remember I'm like, I'm on a court with a, a, a gang of me heads. So I was like, if I try to explain this right now, <laughs> it's, it's probably well. not going to go well. So <laughs> I was like, let me just wait till after I get done with this game. <laughs> and I remember calling her and I'm like, you were right. Like, she was like, I told you. And I was like, wow. And but like stomach issues were gone. Like, even though I went vegetarian, I still had a little bit of, you know, irritability that was in there. But once I literally like cut out all meat and dairy, I just I just felt this overwhelming like joy in my body like everything just seemed to click finally and i never i'm one i'm not one of those people like if you're not vegan i won't talk to you if you're vegan, if you're not yeah. vegan stay away from me i believe in order for us to help people change we have to be a part of the people so like i i go to restaurants that aren't vegan i don't like it necessarily but i'll go and i'll go to events that are vegan but i'm right there because i know in order to help people change you have to be involved with them you have to go where they are Instead of waiting on them to come to us, we have to go where they are and, and, and not condemn them because, I mean, I've only, I honestly only know three people that have been vegan since birth and two of them are my kids. So, like, <laughs> you know, most of I know like one adult that's been vegan since yeah. birth. You know, C so isn't Siva Johnson? You know Siva Johnson, right? Probably who he's talking about. Siva Johnson, is that Oh, who? see, okay, I know two then. <laughs> and Jahina Malik. Oh, Jahina yeah. Malik, who is the vegan bodybuilder. Oh. So there you go. Two people. I know awesome. two. Three. It is Woo! growing. Uh, Carrie Kid. If you ever know Carrie Kid, he's, he's known as the Vanilla Gorilla. Good point. Yep. So I was in a CrossFit class and I was, you know, going to the class and people were asking me in regards to like, oh, the only reason why you're beating us in these drills is because you're younger than us. And I was like, no, I'm actually 42. <laughs> and that's when you saw everybody like, what the, like, what's going on? And, and like I said, I, I've honestly had at least four people in that class that have gone vegan uh, since, since me being a part of that, that program with them. And I'm, you know, I moved on because I'm, I'm not being able to go to class. But we keep in touch. I still keep in touch with. That's the thing. Like I said, I think you have to be a part of the people in order to change the people. Mm -hmm. um, so I still keep in touch with everybody from CrossFit. You know, like that's something I because they always ask questions. They're always curious. You know, and they're on and the paleo or the keto or something. And you, yeah, here you are, yeah. the vegan coming in and kicking their ass. They're like, oh. So good for and you. He's older than me. Like, wait a minute. Like, and <laughs> <laughs> the old man. So you're yeah. you're currently you're still working on um, this amazing film called Hungry for Justice. Hungry for Change. Yes. Oh, justice. it's ju it's justice. Is it Hungry for Justice? It is justice. It's oh, justice. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Both that that's titles are awesome. I, I heard you say it, but I was like, you know what? It, her heart was in the right place. No, is that? Is that <laughs> oh, we got to get the name right, though. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, is that right. it, in the introduction? I misspoke. Okay. Well, you can redo it. Yeah. That's a power. All right. Yeah. So, Hungry for Justice. It could change. They uh, Sometimes titles do, right, before they come out. But it, it is. We are saying it is our running title. Yeah. So, yeah, all right. Because you don't know till the end. But, um, and this explores like the power of the hip hop culture in um, conjunctions, conjunction with those who live in food deserts. So you guys go deep into food deserts and what those are. Um, mm -hmm. And you make a connection between, you know, plant based diet and, and food accessibility. Um, exactly. And you're you're making it with um, uh, Keegan Kuhn, who made Cowspiracy. So as you said earlier, he's and what he's the a, health, yeah, yeah, and what the health, true, good point. So what was the impetus of you wanting to explore this subject in the first place? Growing up in it, but growing up in in a in a place where where you talked about, like a honey bun was considered a carb. You know, uh, you know, it when you, when I had vegetables growing up. And like I said, my mom did the best she could with what she knew. Everything had butter in it. If I had spinach, I never, until I moved to Miami, I had never experienced 
a mango. I didn't know what a mango tasted like. I'd never seen a plantain. I never had guacamole. I never had avocado. There were so many things that I never had. And if I did have a fruit or vegetable, it most likely came from a can, uh, had a ton of salt added to it. I never, I never had the real experience of fresh fruit and vegetables. Um, and, and this is because they how, weren't available, not because your mother didn't know, or was it both? Exactly. It, it just weren't there. Was, there. There's a little bit of both. Because if you if you go to these grocery stores that are close to the hood, because a lot of, they say only about 8% of, you know, people of color live next to a grocery store. That is accessibility. But when you do go to the grocery store, they are there. There is stuff there. It's just that we've been taught that that's horrible and nasty and not good. And like, oh, if you just eat that, you're going to get sick and die. When in reality, if we look at the statistics, it's vice versa. It's the other way around. Mm -hmm. What people are dealing with today with diabetes and heart attacks and heart disease and colon cancer, you got hypertension. None of that is included with eating a plant-based way of life. But and I, and I try not to say diet. Because I always say, and I think I said in the panel that we had together, I always say, uh, you know, if you look at the word diet, I'm not trying to die yet. So I just like, <laughs> it's a way of life, you know. Um, but if you look at the way it is, it's just, it's set up to fail. The system's set up to fail from the advertising to the store, to the way the sales are run, to the highlighted areas, to the packaging. There's no, it, there no, there's no amazing packaging for an orange or grapes or lettuce or kale there's no amazing packaging you go down the aisles though these packages they just scream at you like buy me you, you ever seen somebody look at a package and goes man that looks good and you can't even see the food inside the package right right they go exactly. oh man that looks good yeah. or you read a menu you read a menu and you read what's in the in the actual item you're like man that looks good mm -hmm. you haven't even seen the product yet <laughs> but that's how psychologically it, it happens and, and um, how divorced we are actually from the food we're yeah. just reading about it and getting excited about the advertising for mm -hmm. it rather than the actual smell of the food itself like the orange yeah. and the feel mm -hmm. of it mm -hmm. yeah. And, yeah. and one of the things that helped me out too is uh my my last uh classes of my marketing program at my at my undergraduate degree my teacher, it was a smaller school. It was a historically black college, uh, Harris State College. Got to give them a shout out because I love that school to death. Um, and she, she gave me, she gave us all the graduating class. We're sitting in class. And she's like, I just want to wish you all luck out there because it's going to be tough. And we're like, oh, well, thanks. We're about to hit the real world. We appreciate it. <laughs> and she said, she said, because companies aren't hiring marketers like they used to. They're hiring psychologists. Because when you see that, commercial with the Big Mac and the steam comes up at like 30 seconds or the cheese starts to melt at 15 seconds. That's all psychology. They're looking at the psychology of the mind. What's going to trigger them right now? Oh, mm -hmm. that cheese going down. Mm -hmm. Oh man, that pizza, when they pull the cheese apart on the pizza at a certain time, that's all psychology. That's not necessarily marketing anymore. And that's something that stuck to me when we started discussing this film, like what to do is like, there's such a psychology behind this. And to make us think that we have to have these items of food, that yeah. we have to take, we have to pull the curtain back and show that the Wizard of Oz is just, I hate to say it, but there's just some little white guy back there <laughs> with, a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a trigger and he's just pulling every trigger to make everybody go do it, you know, and that's what's happening. The best marketing is really psychologists behind it. I mean, and, and, and so how is that, how is that food injustice? Because it's it's blatant lies. Um, it's just blatant lies to to make people think that if I mean, just look at some of the commercials. Like the deceiving that you see out there is when people try to say, just look at the food pyramid today. The food pyramid that's put out by the the government per se that goes in every school has meat as the number one thing. If you don't have meat in your diet, you're gonna die. Um, and then what happens is when that meat has a problem in the system, they send you to a hospital and then they say, oh, you know what? You probably should stop eating as much meat when they're the ones that told you <laughs> to start eating all the meat. And then they put you through chemo 
And then once they go through the chemo, then they say, you know what? You need more protein. But instead of saying plant-based protein, they say Mm -hmm. you need more meat. You need more animal protein. So it's just a constant deceiving of telling people that they have to keep eating this animal protein over and over and over when scientifically, I don't care if you're vegan or not, scientifically, you can go look at the numbers and see that that's not the case. The animal protein is putting us in the graves early. It's not helping us at all. Mm-hmm. So tell us about the what you talked about, Dotsy, which is why it's also ra- there's food racism yeah, in I, our I, system. I, I mean, the thing that just, once I uncovered all this, that just makes me the just crazy mad and, and yeah, just yeah. It's just so unfair. And I recognize me, the white chick here talking about this, but it just makes, it gets under my skin as much as the animal cruelty. And that's mm-hmm. the fact in, in, in regards to dairy specifically that we know 65 to 70% of the world's population is intolerant to the lactose and dairy, uh, yep. much higher, right? And people of African descent, uh, Asians, yep. Latino descent, uh, you know, 86%, 76% Asians are 98% um, lactose right. intolerant. And us white people have been milking cows for God knows how long for, you know, what reason? I have no idea. But we did start it. And domination, like always. Right, always. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Follow it right back to that. Um, right. And so we, you know, every single mammal um, has a lactase enzyme to digest the lactose in our own mother's breast milk. Like this is inherently in all of us, right? And this important is there. Uh, Naturally, because our bodies are brilliant, the, that enzyme turns off around the age of three or four or five, depending. So white people or the ones, and and I'm one of them. I could eat a gallon of ice cream back in the day and I felt completely fine. Wait, you're white? Holy shit. No, I'm just (laughs) I know. I was always able to digest it just fine. Um, And, I am seen as normal, but the, cor- the, the correct definition is that I am abnormal because my lactase enzyme did not turn off at the age of four and as it, it should have, have is it should have, right. right? I'm the one with the genetic mutation mm-hmm. and let you know, people of color, how, however we want to say it, they are the normal ones and it makes me nuts that the white man was like you're lactose intolerant when it's like no you're lactose normal we're we're the weird ones and just the whole entire idea surrounding that and the idea that we are pushing a food group on uh children of color and and then it was i mean there's there's 15 percent of white people that the the, you know that the enzymes turned off so in schools and they have to take a milk that this is shown and they try to mm-hmm. prove is is good for them and needed and necessary for growth and for vitality and for learning when in fact obviously it's just the nutrients in cow's milk that we need yeah we need calcium we need pat- potassium we need fat carbohydrate yep. obviously they're and in all the other foods you can get that anywhere um when you when yep. you guys made are, are making this film in the middle of making this film, what are some of the uh, your favorite interviews, uh, favorite <sighs> scenes that have come up surrounding this issue of food injustice and just plain old racism? Let's call it what it is in relation to yeah. dairy. Uh, one of the major things that pops up one is uh, we were interviewing at PCRM in mm-hmm. Washington D.C. and we were given an ad that. It was either Similac or Infamil. I'm sorry, I can't remember the exact company. But they actually had an ad that said, not like insinuated, not tried to hint, it literally said that mother's breast milk was not sufficient to help grow a human baby. <gasps> so if you hear that, mm. who is that, who's going to believe that more than anyone? And who is that going to target more than anyone? So WIC is um, it's a it's a government program that that is for uh, mothers with children. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Just uh, wanted to it, clarify. It, it assists them. Okay. Good. Right. And so it's basically telling these mothers, you know, oh, you don't try to breastfeed. You know what? You need this formula that is formulated from a cow. And and what I always try to break down in reality of things, I tell everybody, I'm not a scientist yet. But I am a realist. And what I always tell people is that if you look at the reality of it, you're taking the milk of a almost a ton. A cow can get up to a ton, 2,000 pounds. 
you're taking the milk that's supposed to help a calf grow to a cow in less than 12 months. It takes them 12 months to get their full size. The human body takes 18 years Mm -hmm. or more to get to its full capacity. And you're wondering why we have problems. It's not meant for us. It's not meant for us. We'll never be 2,000 pounds. As obese as the, the most obese person is, we'll never be 2,000 pounds. And we're taking that growth serum and putting it into a body that has no idea of what it is. It's basically concentrated, and we can't handle it. Mm-hmm. And we're doing it time and time and time again. You have doctors saying you have to do this. Another form of, like, that sticks out in the movie that we talk about when it comes to like the social aspect and the racism aspect is that we found, uh, we did a, a tour um, with Paige who does this, fo- this food justice uh, a program that she has out in LA. And we talk about how there are grocery stores that when they move from a neighborhood, they have a ban on another grocery store being able to move back into their old property. So, they're not moving out of rich neighborhoods. They're moving out of poor neighborhoods. And when they move out of their neighborhood, they have a zone where they're like, no, another, another one can't move into our area. Or they can't even move into a circumference of the area of the old grocery store. What, why, wait, why is that? Is that so that everybody can, has to drive to the new location? <gasps> That's exactly. what Walmart does. Walmart does that. Exactly. You know that? Yeah, Walmart will... will um, will build a, a, a store and then it will ruin all the small um, yeah. businesses in that area. And then that I, Walmart, sorry, go ahead, John. They're, they're called category killers. Uh, Walmart is, mm-hmm. is necessarily called a category killer because if you think about Walmart, what do they try to do? They try to have every category of everything that you want yeah. within their store. In the whole wide world. Like, uh, it's like they, everything. Have vet, they have veterinarians in Walmart now. Wow, like everything uh-huh. they, they called category killers and they go into these smaller uh, rural and, and, and more popular ones too, but they go into these cities and they ruin it for all the companies that had a small business. That was a baker mm-hmm. that was, I hate to admit it, but a butcher, uh, a, a farmer's market. And they're like, you know what? We're going to take all the business. And the, well, we, yeah, we can sell it cheaper. And we're going to be 10 times cheaper than what you are. And now everybody, and now, and you know what the bad part is? The people that own those smaller shops, guess what they end up doing? They end up working at the Walmart Walmart, now because they can't even, they can't even keep their own company. But you see that, you see that zoning happening a lot. And then what happens is that Walmart moves out, closes, actually closes after they've ruined that area, moves a little farther away to, and now everyone has to drive to that Walmart, but it services more of the other it just services more Jeez. areas, right? Mm-hmm. Is that mm-hmm. sounds like exactly what Paige is talking about in terms of grocery stores? Is that correct? Yeah. And it, yes, that's correct. And then and then to even go on to that is who takes more public transportation? It would be people of color. We all know that. Like mm-hmm. when it comes to buses and trains, yes, there are white people that take buses and trains. But let's be honest, who takes the most public transportation? So there's a rule where you can't get on a bus with more than two bags of groceries. So you mean to tell me what? if you got a family of four or five, or even if you're just shopping for yourself for the week, you can only have two bags of groceries. And now you got to go back out to that place again to get more bags to come all the way back. Uh, I, I'm, I'm exactly. speechless right now. Can, yeah, it, exactly. It's, it's one of those things you're like, wow, that's crazy. So it's all these things that add up. And then sometimes you have to think, while this company wasn't trying to be a part of this racism, their g- rules and guidelines, once they find out that, oh, my rules and guidelines actually make it harder for the next person to do something because of the other guidelines, mm-hmm. if they don't adjust to it, then guess what? You're contributing to it. Like, I give you a lot of credit and thank you for saying, oh, I'm a white woman and this pisses me off because I get it a lot. A lot of people always ask, well, what can I do as a white person? It's like, yes, you have to be vocal. A lot of times, yes, as a person of color, we can say as much as we want. We can say we can sit and scream at the top of our lungs from the top of the hill. But until the people that aren't necessarily oppressed by it speak up, yeah. it'll always keep happening. Yeah. Can I because ask you a question the, around that? I cut you ahead. off. I'm sorry. 
you, did you, were, you you finished that? I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, that was you good. good. Okay. I, was, I, I was finished, yeah. Um, I, 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 it, white people tell me all the time, actually, Dotsie, you, you're white. You, you, can't, you can't talk about dietary racism and dairy. You can't talk about food injustice. And actually, one too many white people told me that, which is exactly why it's all I talked about to the USDA. It got me so exactly. pissed off that I said, I, I don't really think, I, I, I think I can because I think if I'm passionate about it and I care about it, I think we need every single color, I'm purple, yellow, black, white, it, bringing this yep. up because each one of us are going to reach a different population maybe and it's important for us to all talk about it. So um, I, I like that there's that validation from you. Cause I, I've been, yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't say I've been not feeling confident about it. Cause I, tr- it in my heart, it, it, it just, I, it makes, it just gets me madder than almost anything. So yeah. I, it's okay. I get to talk about it if that's unfair, but yeah, you know, talk about it, talk about it. No, but that's, that's the thing we, we, and, it, and that comes with any injustice. If, mm-hmm. if the people that are affected by it, they're the ones as much as they talk about it, it'll never mean anything. This goes, this goes with racism. This goes with, you know, economics. You know, if the rich people don't talk good for the people that are not rich, there'll never be a change. Mm. You see what I'm saying? If there's, you know, race, if there's people that are part of a race that sees their counterparts actually being racist and they don't say anything about it, then it'll always happen. Because the person that's, the person that's actually being marginalized as being uh, put down, they don't care about their opinions anyway. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter. So it has to come from somebody that looks like them. It has to come from somebody with the same status. It has to come from somebody that can sit down at the table with them. You know, they wouldn't sit down at a table with the person that they're being racist to anyway. Mm-hmm. So they wouldn't care. I felt so that some in women's rights. That. In a way, where it's a kind of like say that again. I felt that a little bit at, at different times it, um, in standing up for women's rights. So like, yeah, a, and it's like they're like, oh, that's that's cute. That's good that you're doing that. You should stand up for it. But really, when you go into apply for a job, it should be the best candidate. You can't just have like an equal. You know, and we'll go on. Exactly. And so yeah, yeah, it's like oh yeah, but it's no, it's whatever. In that case, men that exactly need so to if, stand if up it is, for it. If it is women's rights, if men don't say anything, yeah. It'll never change. And guess what? It'll always keep going on. Mm-hmm. It's, if it goes for gay rights, if mm-hmm. it, the gay if if gay people always try to say something with their voice, yeah, somebody's going to hear it. But until straight people say, "Yo, we really shouldn't be treating them like this," it's never going to change. Same thing goes with racism. I wanted to ask you about how your veganism and your experience as a black man intersect in terms of your empathy for those who can't speak up or don't have the power to speak up? I, th- I think just growing up and, and witnessing injustice, I think that's, that's really what empowered me to go deeper into the vegan, you know, rabbit hole, uh, as you could say, because I, I didn't start. And I believe that that question did come up earlier in the interview. I didn't start for animal rights. I started for health. Um, but as I kept going, it started not only being for health, it started to be for animal rights. It started to be for social justice. It started to in, I did it for in racism. Uh, I did it to, for, to save the planet. It's just so many things that come along that you see that this system is not designed for the wellness of the planet in general. And it's to step away from that and to go into veganism and to go into this, aspect of causing as as least amount of harm as you can because we all know as much as we try veganism is not a perfect science it is not it will it probably never will be but we are with the intents of causing as the least amount of harm to every living thing in the world and that includes human so my thing is all about love i mean don't get me wrong i do get mad i do get upset i do see things and they infuriate me i just literally saw a story today of a seven-year-old that was killed back in my neighborhood, back in St. Louis, that was shot. Um, You know, like that pisses me off. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I know I have to speak out about it and, and, and ask people, where's the love? Like they need to see stories like that. I know I get a lot of flack sometimes because people come to my page and they just want to see, 
sunshine and food. But I think also you have to speak up like we just talked about. You have to speak up about it and you have to get people to see where the flaws are. Now, you don't have to condemn them about it, but you have to show people we have flaws and this is where we can do to get better about it. And that came from speaking up from not only animals, but people from the environment that the environment can't speak up for itself either. You know, our, our kids that we're trying to leave this planet for, we have to speak up for them too. Mm -hmm. So it's just so many things that we have to speak up for. And, and you don't, you don't ever have to be silent. What you say and how you say it speaks more volumes, but you have to, you have to speak up. Great. Thank you so much, John. Thanks for being on our show. We'd like Thank to you have you invite. back when your documentary comes out so Most we can definitely. talk about definitely. it more. And uh, yeah, we definitely want to talk about your experiences filming the documentary, more stories yeah. and things. Yeah. And yeah. tell everybody I'm, where they can find you before we go, please. Uh, you can find me at Twitter, Instagram. Um, I think I even got a Pinterest. It's all under Badass <laughs> Vegan. Um, it's Snapchat. I, I made sure it's uniforms. So everything's under Badass Vegan, even Facebook fan page. Uh, you can also send me a message at john at badassvegan.com. You can take a look at the website. I try to put as many tips and uh, things as possible on there. Um, I actually was with uh, Vegan Outreach. I'm on the cover of the uh, the Compassionate Vegan uh, cool. you know, guide to help people transfer over. So you can find me there. That's a great guide to help people transition. And um, I'm going to send you to... Uh, the trait the teaser to the film like it can't share it yet i'm okay. gonna let you all see it <laughs> thank you that's awesome that's and everybody incredible. uh Excited. yeah check out the also uh his uh, vegan smart nutrition shakes yes and yes. uh the bav strawberry short and one day i'll get yeah. to try it you'll share with <laughs> I'm me sorry. i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry but i did make You're a perfect. promise like she said i did and you kept it promise. i appreciate she, that he sure did it was amazing <laughs> thank you so much john <laughs> thank we'll you all you so much too thank you so thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future.